Welcome. This is George Della with Power for Today Prophetic Ministries coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. As we are uh, beginning this new year with our Tuesday night Bible study, and uh, I want I, I pray that I uh, trust that everybody had a blessed uh, Christmas as we celebrated the coming of Jesus Christ uh, uh, to be to that, that God would be with us, Emmanuel. And uh, I pray that uh, all of you will have a healthy and prosperous New Year as we uh, begin this, this new year. And I, I'm, I'm really praying and believing uh, that we're going to see a mighty move of God uh, in this coming year because we desperately need one uh, both in the church as well as in our nations. We need a great awakening uh, that people will turn back to righteousness and that God will restore his word and his name uh, in our nations once again. But before we get into the word tonight and uh, uh, begin to share some things that the Lord has uh, put on my heart for this coming year, uh, let's just take a, a, a moment and let's pray uh, that God would prepare our hearts to hear and to receive uh, what he has for us. So right now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, we want to thank you, Lord, as we come together tonight to uh, study your word, Lord, and to hear what you are speaking to your church, to your people from heaven uh, for this new year. Father, we just pray as we enter into this new year that you would just uh, uh, touch the hearts of your people all across the world, Lord, and that you would bring renewal and restoration, reformation and uh, revival to the hearts of your people, Lord, that you would renew the passion, the zeal, the fervency uh, in the hearts of your people, O oh God, that uh, uh, your people, Lord, would be a generation that seeks your face, a, a people that call upon your name, that stir themselves up to take hold of you. I pray, Father, that you would renew that, uh, that divine compulsion uh, in every heart, to really uh, uh, turn, set our hearts and minds to seek you like never before, and to not only seek you, but to really begin to listen and obey the things, Lord, that you have called us to as the body of Christ. I pray, O oh God, that this year will bring a great birthing uh, in the church of Jesus Christ, uh, a renewed emphasis, Lord, to reach souls and to uh, be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious church and a holy bride, uh, a people, Lord, that uh, no longer live for themselves, but they live for the ones, the one who died for us, for Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh God, that you would work in every one of our hearts to will and to do of your good pleasure. You would give us a heart of humility, a, a broken and contrite heart uh, that is fully surrendered, fully committed to you in all willingness and obedience. I pray, O oh God, that... Uh, we will begin to walk out the things that, that you have purposed for your people. That we will no longer just be hearers of the word, Lord, but to be doers of the word and all pleasing unto you. And Father, I pray that you would give every one of us that spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better as you open the eyes of our understanding to know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your incomparably great power for us who believe. Lord, circumcise our ears to hear and put your salve upon our eyes to see and uh, open the word to our understanding and we welcome it, Lord, as it is in truth, the word of God, which works effectively in those who believe. And we proclaim tonight as the people of God, we believe, Lord, and we receive and welcome that word into our hearts and pray that the Holy Spirit would make it take root and bear the fruits of your kingdom in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, praise God. It's 2019. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that we are actually in 2019. Uh, I, I remember it doesn't seem that long ago when we were, you know, everybody was in, in you know, wondering what was going to happen when it, when the clock turned to 2000 and, and uh, everybody was concerned about everything falling apart and computers uh, not working right and everything going crazy and Y2K and all of those things. 
And uh, here we are, uh, 19 years later. It, it's, it's hard to believe. But uh, as I've been praying and, and uh, seeking God for this new year, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, uh, the Lord uh, has put a word in my heart for the church, for the body of Christ. And it has to do with 2019 being a year of doing, a year of doing. Amen? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he tells us that he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. The Bible tells us that God has put eternity in the hearts of his people. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, he says, If then, if you were raised with Christ, in other words, if, you, if you've been born again, you're a true child of God, you've been, you've been uh, died and buried and now have been raised up with Christ, he says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also with, uh, will appear with him in glory. I, I, I want to say tonight, we need in the church, in the body of Christ, to get back to an eternal mindset. Every person in the church needs to have an eternal perspective in everything that we do that our life is about eternal things, that we are not getting mired down and, and bogged down in the affairs of this life and the things on this earth. But we walk, we live according to eternity, that we have an eternal perspective that, that directs everything we do so that our purpose is for eternity. This is the way we see the New Testament church uh, uh, live. They lived with an eternal mindset. When you look at Paul, uh, Paul is a prime example who's someone who lived with an eternal mindset. When he made statements like, I consider my present sufferings not worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in me. I, I, that's what he was talking about. His mind was set. It was focused on the eternal things of God. And everything he did was for eternal purposes. It wasn't about this life. It wasn't about living for this life and living for the things of the earth and, and, and uh, uh, doing things that make himself comfortable and, you know, try to get and consume things upon this earth. His life was consumed with doing the will of God. His life was consumed with uh, making sure that when that day comes, that he was prepared for eternity, that, that he did everything possible in his life uh, to be uh, uh, he even said himself that he not be disqualified in that day, but he would keep everything, every part of his life would be focused on the eternal things of God. So everything he did was valuable for the kingdom of God. It was purposed uh, with God's purpose. It was filled uh, with eternal uh, perspective. And we need to get back to that because when we look at the church today, the vast majority of professing Christians today really lack an eternal perspective and, and their life is more about this earth and the things of this earth and this life and, and uh, building their life here and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to be comfortable, trying to uh, uh, amass things for themselves. They have no real eternal perspective and so we're not seeing them being focused and doing the things that have to do with eternity, with eternity that are going to last that are going to uh, bear fruits, that are going to remain and be acceptable by, by God. And we need to get back to that as a church and begin to really focus on the things that we ought to be about. Focus on the things of God. Focus on the things that God has called us to do. And uh, that's why I say 2019 needs to be a year of doing. We've been hearing a lot. We've listened to lots of sermons. Christians have, have uh, heard many, many, many sermons and heard much word, but the problem is that hearing is not resulting in doing, and that's where we need to go to. Now, in order to really be effective in the things that we do, I, I want to read uh, 
Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 2. And uh, this needs to be a primary part of getting so that when we actually launch forth to do the things that God has called us to do, that they will bear fruit that remains, that they will be effective and productive and uh, acceptable in God's sight. Notice what they says here. This was the church in Antioch. This is where Paul and Barnabas were. And he says in verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, okay, then the, the Spirit of God, they, first of all, they were praying for God's direction. They were fasting and praying for God's direction to know what it was, the specifics uh, uh, for them, for that church, for those people, uh, what God wanted them to do at that season that they were in. Well, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and gave them direction concerning what they were to do. They were to separate Paul and Barnabas for this work. Now, notice what they did. They didn't just immediately go running out, okay? He says, uh, Then, having fasted and prayed, again, continuing to fast and pray. They received the direction. Now they're praying over it. They're continuing to fast and praying over the direction that God gave them and laid hands on them. They sent them away, okay? So they, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And then it goes on to tell how Paul and Barnabas went out to do the work that God had called them to do. And as they did, you'll find that they continued to seek God's direction. Even as they went, they continued to pray. So what I'm trying to say in this is, God's called us to do, but everything needs to be prepared with prayer and fasting. And uh, I I'm just going to throw this in. Uh, if you want to join in this, but Tabernacle of David in Richmond, Virginia, who uh, this uh, 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 Bible study is primarily targeted with. I've been working with them because I worked with them when I lived in Richmond. Now that I'm in Ohio, I continue to work with them through these Bible studies. But uh, they, uh, every year, for many, many years, uh, at the beginning of every year, they have been uh, calling the church to a time of prayer and fasting as they prepare themselves and seek the direction of God uh, for their church and uh, for the people uh, for the new year. Well, this year they're doing it again. And they're going to begin uh, this Friday, uh, January 4th, uh, 2019. And if you would like to join in that, they're going to be doing a seven-day fast and time of prayer they're going to be targeting uh, specific areas uh, uh, that the Lord leads them in. But uh, if you want to join in that, this is an ideal time to prepare yourself for this coming year that God can give you direction for your life, the things that He wants to separate you for, to do your calling, your ministry, to be fulfilled. And I want to encourage you to maybe uh, join with them beginning this Friday for the next seven days and to take that time to pray and fast uh, as the Lord uh, 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 leads you and seek that direction for yourself and seek uh, uh, make this a time of consecration whereby you give yourself over to God's will and purpose and that God would uh, put it into your heart to begin to do the things that he has uh, ordained from the foundations of the earth for you to accomplish those works that God is waiting for you to take up the cross and to do. Amen? Now, let's move on here, and I want to get into this uh, again. We need to have this eternal perspective. We need to get back to what's truly important as Christians, to what it is that God's purpose, his ultimate purpose, his very basic purpose for every one of us as the body of Christ, as the disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to begin in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 39. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, Jesus tells us uh, here that the greatest commandment, in other words, God's highest purpose, his number one purpose, his number one commandment to every Christian is to love God, 
to love Him with all your heart, soul, and strength. That means that you love God your whole life. Again, talk about that eternal perspective. Your whole life is focused on loving, pleasing, obeying God. Amen? Serving God. That's what it's about. That is the primary commandment that God has given to every one of us. That God has the preeminence in our lives. That, that everything about us, our lives, is about Him first and foremost. We don't have any other idols before God. Nothing takes precedence. Nothing uh, 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 takes the preeminence over God being first in our life. And then secondly, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now in 1 John chapter 3.18 John expands a little bit on this, what, what, that, what that love looks like, what it, what, it, what it really means, what it entails. He says, my little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. So John's now saying, listen, when we're called to love, we're not to do it just in word and tongue. And let me tell you something, when we look at the church today, that's a lot of what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of professing love for God in word and tongue, but it never carries over to what John is saying. Well, we're not to love just in word and tongue. We're to love in deed, in truth. In other words, if our love does not translate to action, it's not real love. It's not real love. Amen? Now, let's, let's take this a little further. James chapter 1, uh, verse 22. Look what James says. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So now James throws in another little facet to this thing. Here John is saying, we can't love God just in word. We can't just say things, say we love God, or say we love our brethren, and not do anything. That's not love. That's not real love. John's saying, you've got to do something. You've got to your love has to come to a place where it, it becomes action. It can be seen. It can be evidence that your love is real. And then James says, part of that love, part of that, uh, uh, that whole concept has to do with not just, again, not just hearing the Word of God, but doing the Word of God. You have to do the Word of God. Now listen, what, J what James is saying. If we are hearing and not doing, we are deceived. We're deceived. If we're hearing and not doing, we're deceived. We are deceiving ourselves. Because again, when God speaks to us, when God tells us to do something, and we go around professing, oh, we love God, and we sing these songs, and, and, and we just tell everybody how we love God, but we're not doing the things that God tells us to do, we are self-deceived. Why? Because that's not love, and, and that's not obedience. And as I'm going to show you right here in this next scripture, it's not faith either. It's not real faith, okay? James chapter 2, verse 20. But do you want to know, O oh, uh, but do you want to know, O oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without works is dead. Love without action is dead. Hearing without doing is dead. It's deception. It's a lie. You're fooling yourself. You're foolish. If you think you can love with no action, if you can hear and not do, if you can say you believe and it doesn't result in you doing something, there's no works to give evidence that your faith is real. He's telling us that's not real faith and that's not real love. Okay? Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things which I say. In other words, he's saying the same exact same, same thing that James just said. He says, why do you call me Lord? Why do you say that you believe that I am the Christ, the Son of a living God? I am the Lord. I am God. Why do you say that? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but then you don't do what I say? Jesus is saying you're deceived. That's not faith. You don't really believe. 
You don't believe I'm Lord. Because when you believe I'm Lord, you will do what I say do. And I'm telling you that many in the body of Christ are in this condition. They say things with their mouth. They sing songs. They, they make confessions. But the reality is, it never translates into doing, into action, into uh, uh, the works that ought to be done. And uh, this was the great indictment that the God had with Israel. He told Israel, you, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. In other words, you, 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 you have this show, you have this form, you, you say the right things, you say you believe, you say you love me, you, you say that uh, uh, I'm your God, but then it's not in your heart because it's not producing the works, it's not producing the obedience, it's not producing the doing. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said again the very same thing. He says, many in the last days, many in that day will say to me, or I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying, many uh, will say, Lord, Lord, in that day, okay? Many, he talks about, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, many are going to say it, but not, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they're not doing the will of the Father. Again, what is Jesus saying? Love with no action, with no deeds, is not love. Faith with no works is not faith. It's not real. It's a deception. You've deceived yourselves. You're lying to yourself. You're saying everything's okay because I believe, but my faith is doesn't take me anywhere. It doesn't produce anything in my life. And over and over again, we see this, this, this uh, uh, concept through the scriptures, from the very mouth of Jesus, from, from his apostles, uh, all of them saying the same thing. Real faith must result in obedience. It must result in works. It must result in us acting upon what we say we believe. Otherwise, it is not real faith. It is not true love. Now look what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21. And Jesus doesn't pull any punches. Jesus lays it right out there and puts us right in our face. Listen to what he's saying. He who has my commandments and keeps them, there it is again. He's given us his commandments. He's given us his word, okay? He's given us his commandments in this word. And he says, if you have them, if you've been given these commandments, and you keep them, you do what he said do, it is he who loves me. Now, he's not pulling any punches here. He's, he's making it real plain. If you keep my commandments, you are showing the evidence that you love me, that you really love me, okay? And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and, and manifest myself to him. And then he goes on and he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, okay? That's the commandments of God. This word is the commandments of God. That's why he gave it to us. It tells us exactly what God requires of us. It tells us exactly what God is asking us to do, okay? So he's telling us and making it plain. If you really love me, you're going to keep my word. You're going to do what I say, what I have uh, given unto you, these commandments. Look what he says. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Okay? Now what's he saying? I'm going to abide in you and you're going to abide in me. But it's based on us revealing our true faith, revealing our true love by doing what Jesus says. That when we say Jesus is Lord, we mean it. That means we do exactly what he says. Why? Because he's Lord. He's God. He is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of a living God. And we have no choice. We have no other option but to do what he says do because we really believe what we say. 
Now look what he says on the other side. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Now this is from the mouth of Jesus himself. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In other words, he's saying, you're not just disobeying Jesus, you're disobeying the Father. Because it's the Father's word, it's the Father's commandments, it's, it, it, it's, it's His. But you hear what he's saying. If you really love me, don't let it be just in word, in mouth, in tongue. It has to be in works. It has to be in deeds. In other words, if you say you love me, then do what I tell you to do. Because the reality is, this is how people will know if you really love Jesus or not. If you really love Jesus, you'll be doing the things he said do. But if you're not doing what he said do, if you're not keeping his word, if you're not uh, living according to the word of God uh, by the Holy Spirit, again, guess what? You don't really love him. You're deceived. You're lying to yourself. Amen? And that's not me. I'm not telling you this. This is what Jesus is telling us. Read it for yourself. Be like the Bereans. Get in the Word. Check out what I'm telling. I'm just reading the Scripture to you. Read it for yourself. And come before God with a spirit of humility to hear and to heed what He's saying. Because again, the, the, the church has gotten into this, this rut of, of uh, ritual, of religion where we just go Sunday after Sunday and we hear and we hear and we hear and we hear and we never walk out the things we're hearing. We're like Paul told uh, uh, Timothy in, 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 in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, ever hearing but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. In other words, we're, we're, we're ever hearing the Word of God, we're ever hearing sermons, we're ever listening to tapes, we're ever reading books, we're ever, you know, all of this hearing, hearing, but the word is never getting into the heart. It's never taking root inside of us whereby it begins to bear the fruits of the kingdom. We're not hearing it with understanding ears, with understanding hearts, with real faith that enables that word to be empowered, to be carried out in our lives, to fulfill the obedience of that word, to do what Jesus says to do. And that's a serious problem in today's church. And we really need to get a hold of this. We really need to let 2019 be a time of consecration, a, a, a time of revival, renewal, reformation, and restoration in the church, in the body of Christ, to where we become not hearers only, but doers of the Word of God, that we uh, will begin to walk out the things that we're hearing and show the evidence that we truly love God, that we truly have faith. That what we hear, we do. That we are free from deception. We're not lying to ourselves, but we are walking humbly with our God and, and fulfilling His will and purpose in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, he says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. So, 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 again, there's no excuse for not doing the things God's called us to do. There's no excuse for, for disobeying God, for not uh, loving Him with action, for not obeying Him, hearing Him, and doing the Word. There's no excuse. Why? Because God gives us the grace, the power, to do whatever He tells us to do, to fulfill whatever He calls us to do. That's why, again, if I go back to, to Acts chapter 13, when they prayed and the Holy Spirit spoke and he says, separate for me, now for me, Paul and Barnabas, to go and do the work to which I have called them. What did they do? They prayed and they went. Why? Because they had God's grace. And they knew that God was with them to do exactly what he called them to do. And that's what we see all through the book of Acts. As they did what God called them to do, God was with them with grace, with power, with demonstration to help them accomplish everything that God called them to do. Just as we prayed earlier, God works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. 
And what does he do? He gives us the grace to do what? To serve God acceptably. To serve God acceptably. In other words, in a way that pleases God. Not our way. God's way. To serve God God's way. In an acceptable way. A way that pleases God. A way that God accepts. And how is that? How do we serve God acceptably? With reverence and godly fear. With reverence and godly fear. In other words, we do it in humility. We do it in obedience because we really love God. And we live for God. We give Him the preeminence. We, we, we have this relationship of intimacy with God where we know He is God and we're just His people. We're His servants. And that godly fear is something that God imparts into us so that we don't depart from Him. We don't go to the left and to the right so that we can walk that straight and narrow road and we can do the things that God has called us to. Because that fear of God will keep us in the right way. It'll keep us from sin. It'll keep us in the path of righteousness and holiness to serve God in His presence all the days of our life. Now let's look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord God, your God, require of you? What does God require of you? He, and again, you know, this is, this is to Israel specifically, but Israel's now the church. It's speaking to the same people. Okay, it's speaking to those God's people, God's people. And today that means God's church, God's born again, children of God. That's who he's talking about. What does God require? What is acceptable to God? Well, what did he just say? That we serve him with reverence and godly fear. Well, what does he tell us here? How, how, what does God require? But to fear the Lord your God. To fear the Lord your God. That's what God requires of every child of God that we fear him. Now listen, if you're not obeying God, if you're not doing the things that God has called you to do, if you're not, if you're not living a life for God, free from sin, then the reality is you have no fear of God. You see, the, the Bible says the transgression of the wicked says he has no fear of God. Because when you fear God, you don't do things willfully and habitually that displease Him. You just don't do that. Why? Because that's not fearing God. That's not loving God. That's not obeying God. That's not serving God. That's not acceptable to God. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to take your sin away. To give you a new nature of righteousness and, and holiness. To give you His grace. And put the fear of God in you so that you will walk uprightly with God in an acceptable way. And he goes on to say, what does God require? That you fear him. And then he explains, how, what does that look like? What does it mean to fear God? Well, he tells us that we walk in all his ways. We walk in the ways of God. We don't walk in our own ways. We have that eternal perspective. We walk in the ways of God to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You see, God requires us. Remember the first commandment, the greatest commandment? Jesus says this is the first, the greatest commandment, that you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Well, he tells us to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength means that you serve God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Now, let me ask you this. Let's be honest with ourselves. When we look at the overall body of Christ today, when we look at the overall church, do we really see a people? And I'm talking about the majority that truly love God with all their hearts own strength. In other words, they live for God. They obey God. They're not living in willful sin. They're, they're, they're serving God with all their heart, soul, and strength, doing the things that God called them to do, going out, making disciples, being his witness, uh, being in prayer, being in the word of God, doing the things that, do we see that? Well, if we're really honest with ourselves, the vast majority of the church today Honors God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They are not doing the things that Jesus has called us to do. Now let's look at this. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 45, just to show you the seriousness of this, that, that when God tells us that he has commanded us, he has called us, that this is what it means to fear him, to serve him, not just love him, but to serve him with all your heart, your soul, your being. Look what he says in Deuteronomy 28. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed. Now listen to this. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. Now look what he says right here. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Did you hear what he just said? When we don't serve God, when we don't obey God and do the things he's called us to do, we are opening ourselves up to a curse to be upon us and our house. Now, some will say, well, you know, that's under the old covenant. Well, it's under the new covenant as well. If you read uh, Hebrews chapter 10, he tells us, if we willfully continue to sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, in other words, after having received this great salvation, this gift of God, he says we deserve more punishment than they did under Moses and the law. And there's many examples in there. I'm not going to get all that right now. But I just want you to see when God says he requires certain things of us, he's not fooling. He's not playing games. When you walk after the lust of your flesh, read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Read it for yourself. Look what he says. The prince of the power of the air is working in the sons of disobedience. Those who are living, walking after the lust of their flesh. You're not, you're not uh, uh, under God's uh, 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 blessing and God's grace when you're living after the lust of your flesh and sin and, 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 and uh, habitual sin and disobedience. You are under the power of Satan. You're under a curse. You bring yourself back under the curse that Jesus came to redeem you from by becoming a curse for you. But look what he says. When he talks about loving God, fearing God, that means we are to serve God with everything we have, all of our heart, soul, and strength, and not just to do it, not just to do it grudgingly, but he says to, to serve him with all your heart and soul and to do it, what? With joy and gladness of heart. In other words, it is a joy. It is our desire. It's our heart's desire. It's what we want to do. We want to please God. We want to serve God. We want to show, to give the evidence, where we truly love God. So we do it with joy and gladness of heart. Not complaining and, and bitterness and whining and crying every time something doesn't go our way or, or things don't work out the way we want them to work out. No, joy and gladness of heart. Why? Because of the abundance of everything God's given us. Because of the abundance of this, this, this great salvation that God has given us. For the abundance of grace that God gives us. The abundance of love that God gives us. The abundance of, of His blessings that God gives us as His children. Do you see that? Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard to them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Now look what he says. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked. Now watch this. Between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Do you hear what Malachi is saying? People will discern the true children of God, the true disciples of Jesus Christ, the true born-again, redeemed saints of God. How? Righteousness versus wickedness. 
Those who serve God and those who do not serve God. Why? Because when we don't serve God as He has commanded us, we are in disobedience, unbelief, and uh, wickedness. As Jesus said, if you continue to read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, if you're not doing the will of, his, of the Father in heaven, He calls them what? Lawless. You're lawless. You are not living under the headship of Christ. You are not being led by the Holy Spirit who's been given unto you. You are, you are disparaging the very name of Jesus by saying that you love him and saying that, you, that, that, you, uh, that he's your Lord and, and, and saying that you're a disciple when you're not doing the things that God called you to do, when you are not fulfilling the will of the Father. Now, this was the very purpose of, of the priesthood. I'm just going to give you a couple verses of these because, again, I don't have time for this, for, for this message. But this, this, is, this is so important. And I don't want to rush it, but uh, uh, the, the, the third Tuesday, I'm going to, I'm going to get back into this. But, but listen to what he says here. Because you're going to find when we look at this, when we really look about what we're saying here, what it means to love God, to obey God, to hear and to do, to serve. It's the very root, it's, 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 a very, it's the very foundational, the, the very purpose of God's salvation. Look what he says in Numbers 18, 7. He says, I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service. I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service. What's he saying? I've made you priests in order that what? That you might serve me. Isn't that what Malachi just said? Isn't that what Malachi said? As a man spares his own son who serves them, I will make you my jewels, those who serve me. Okay? 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Why? What is the purpose of being the priesthood of God? Every one of us are priests. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What is the purpose of being a priest? to proclaim the praise of God, to declare the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.9, For God is my witness. This is the Amplified Bible. Listen to what Paul says. For God is my witness. Now listen to word, Paul's words, how he talks about himself. Whom I serve with my whole spirit. <laughs> See, Paul understood. Paul was walking, living this out in his life. He had this eternal perspective. He not only loved God with all his heart, soul, and strength, he served God with all of his heart, soul, and strength. He, he declared himself, I serve God with my whole spirit. Doing what? Rendering priestly and spiritual service. Rendering priestly and spiritual service. How do you rend uh, priestly service? In preaching the gospel and telling the good news of his son. That's what priestly service is. Everything God did in your life to save you and to put the Holy Spirit in you, to give you his power was to this end that you would receive this priesthood as a gift from God for service back to Him. And how do we serve God? By preaching the gospel and telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 15. Paul goes on to say this, Still, and still on some points I've written to you more boldly and unreservedly by way of reminder. I have done so because of the grace bestowed on me by God. Now, remember what we just said a minute ago. What does God give us so that we can fulfill the requirements of God? He gives us what? He gives us His grace. God gives us His grace so that we can serve Him with reverence and godly fear. Well, Paul's saying the same thing. God has given me His grace. Why? Why did He have God's grace that was bestowed upon Him by God? in making me a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Again, his priestly service. He gave Paul grace to minister, to minister Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So I look at what Paul says again. I act in the priestly service of the gospel. I act in the priestly service of God. What's Paul saying? This is what a priest does. He preaches the gospel, the good news of God. Why? In order that the sacrificial offering of the Gentiles, of the lost, may be acceptable to God, consecrated, and made holy 
by the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness. That's, that, that, listen. Go online. Get a map for about whatever you need. Go read these scriptures for yourself. Read uh, 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 Numbers 18, 7, 1 Peter 2, 9, Romans 1, 9, Romans 15, 15, and 16. Get this in your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to burn this into your spirit, to burn it into your heart, that place of faith, that place of understanding, to give you the revelation of these things. Because again, every Christian is supposed to be a priest. And the only way to fulfill the priesthood that we have been commanded by God, by Jesus himself, out of his own lips, is to love God as evidence by serving God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And how do we do that? By preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to every creature, being his witness, fulfilling this priestly service, this mandate of God, to, to do exactly what he said to do, to proclaim the praises of God. Proclaim the praise of God, the good news of what God has done for us and wants to do for everybody. <clears throat> so I say again, when we look at today's church, how many are doing what God said do? How many love God not just in word and tongue, but in deeds, by doing what Jesus said do. Go therefore and make disciples. How many are really believing, really loving, really fearing God the way we ought, hearing and doing what God said do? And how many are merely honoring him with their lips Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and going right back into the same way as Monday after Monday after Monday and them claiming to love God, claiming to obey God, that he's their Lord, that he's their God. And the reality is they're deceived. They're deceived. And that's a dangerous place to be because if you go back and read Matthew 7, uh, 21 on through uh, 25, 26, you're going to see the end result of those that are deceived, that are not doing the will of God. Jesus said, when that day comes, says, I don't know you, you workers of lawlessness. In other words, you are not one of my true children because you don't really love me, you don't really believe me, and you don't obey me or serve me the way you are. God help us. Now I'm bringing this word to you because I believe God put this word in my heart for the body of Christ because again, there's way too many that profess Jesus Christ as Lord, but there's no evidence, there's no fruit. And uh, today is the 1st, so the uh, 8th, the 15th of January, I'm going to be back here at 735 to complete this message, to carry on with this message, because I believe this is essential for this year of 2019. If you really believe we're in the last days, if you really believe all these things that are going on all around us, all around the earth, that we are truly in the last days, then we need to repent. We need to consecrate ourselves back to God. We need to get into a, a, an attitude of humility and brokenness. We need to humbly come before God and pray that he would wash us again in the blood of a lamb, that he would wash us, sanctify us, and justify us, that he would take us back to the cross and root out this, 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 this nature of sin, this, this uh, hardness of heart that is preventing us from truly demonstrating a true love and faith for God and get us right before it's too late. Before either we die and have to face God or Jesus comes and leaves us behind saying, I don't know you. I want to encourage you. This, this video will be on Facebook. It'll be on YouTube tomorrow. You need to go back, listen to it, write down the scriptures. Pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to open your understanding. This is serious. This is serious. We need to be a church that does. Jesus is coming back for a glorious church and a holy bride. That's a church that obeys him that loves him with deeds, that does what he says, 
that serves him and loves him with all their heart, soul, and strength, that obey his commandments and do his judgments, his statutes, that walk humbly with him and do the things that he's called us to do. And if you can't say that with honesty, then you need to go back and ask God to forgive you. Repent and humble yourself and let God do a real work in you. Put the love of Christ back in your heart, that constraining love to no longer live for yourself, but to live for the one who died for you. Amen. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would open every ear, open every heart, Lord, not just to hear, but to hear and to heed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God and the commandments of God that you have given us, that we would truly be a church that walks out our love, that walks out our faith, that walks out our obedience in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to you, that we are a church that does what you've called us to do, that as the priests of God, we live, we exist, we are here for that primary purpose, to seek and to save that which is lost, to make, to be a witness, to make disciples, to, 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 to preach this gospel, this, this priestly service of preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. God convict the multitudes that say, Lord, Lord, but don't do what you said to do, that don't do your will. Lord, convict them. Send the spirit of the fear of God upon your church like never before to grip the hearts of the disobedient, to grip the hearts, oh God, that have been deceived by themselves in their disobedience, in their lack of true love service, that they would turn from their wicked ways, that they would truly repent and surrender themselves to the real working of Christ to make them a new creation. And I pray, oh God, that you would just reinstill, restore that zeal, that fervency, that passion back into the hearts of every child of God. And constrain us with your love that we will begin to do exactly what you've commanded us to do. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray for those that are listening to this broadcast. If there be any sick among us, if there be any, Lord, that have gone back into sin, gone back under the power of the enemy, that you would deliver them and set them free once again. Lord, bring them to that place. Convict them. Draw them. Reveal the reality of this redemptive work of Christ. And restore, Lord, that nature of righteousness and holiness. Wash them clean once again, Lord. And bring a great revival among your people. That they will rise up out of the darkness with the glory of God upon them once again to reveal your righteousness, your salvation like a burning torch, that kings and Gentiles be drawn to the brightness of your rising. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. Again, you can watch these videos, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, uh, be back January 15th, 7.35, Facebook Live. To get the rest of this message, you need to hear it. You need to get a hold of it and let it change your life. Amen. And let me encourage you to keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh. Amen. We love you and appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen.